Yes, I should say we will record the talk, but not the question period. Okay. Um, can you see the presentation? Okay, fine. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to present uh, this work in front of some uh, new and old friends. Um, as the title of my talk may suggest, uh, its scope is quite broad since it uh, refers to a whole discipline, namely the social ontology of food. But of course, I'm not going to um, present a talk that uh, uh, has the ambitions of um, uh, go through the whole discipline, but uh, I'd like just to touch upon several foundational uh, topics or key issues. Um, first of all, I think there are uh, two ways of uh, um, addressing uh, social ontology of food. On the one hand, one can uh, uh, study the relationship between uh, food and uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, well-studied um, social uh, kinds such as gender, race, class, collective identity, and so on and so forth. Uh, as, for instance, uh, Celia Slanger nicely did uh, in a paper several, several uh, years ago, uh, where uh, uh, she wrote something uh, about the relationship between food and gender. On the other hand, however, one can study the place and uh, the role played by food within social reality, and so how food uh, is shaped by social reality, and uh, what does it mean for a food to be a social outcome of a social structure. And uh, I'm going to take in the, this uh, second avenue of research in this, uh, in this talk. Um, okay, so in order to proceed, I uh, divide my talk in uh, five steps. First, I'm going to uh, outline the domain of inquiry and then I'm going to lay down at least three different approaches to this domain. Uh, they uh, give rise to uh, two different uh, um, notions or uh, conception of food related to social reality, and uh, I'm going to present them. Uh, I label them naturalism and structuralism, and I'm going to um, uh, advance uh, some uh, arguments to endorse uh, structuralism. Uh, then in the fourth and the fifth part, uh, I'm going to explain how uh, food as a social object relates to social reality and how social structures uh, can deliver food as a social object. Uh, this last part of the work, the very last part of the work, uh, trades on a paper I wrote with Andrea Borghini that is called uh, um, on interpreting something as food. And uh, to be honest, the whole talk uh, uh, owes a depth of uh, gratitude to the countless conversations I had with Andrea and Beatrice Serini. But as uh, it usually said, uh, all the mistakes uh, are uh, mine, of course. So um, first, let me begin with the domain of inquiry. One, when one thinks about food, the first thing uh, he may think is, the, is that uh, food is an, an edible item. Uh, however, when we uh, study it from a social ontological standpoint, we can see that many other different dimensions that are not related to edibility uh, arises. Uh, for instance, when we uh, talk or think about Italian food, uh, other dimensions emerge, for, uh, for instance, uh, political, economical, um, aesthetical dimension. Uh, Italian food uh, somehow reflect uh, a part of Italian identity. It is, very, it is a commodity or a set of commodities. Uh, and so it is uh, also an economic item. And, uh, but uh, that's just an, uh, an half of the story since uh, also other things uh, uh, are related to food as a social object. For instance, uh, agents uh, mm, such as producers uh, or consumers uh, or institutions that should recognize uh, uh, that an item uh, 
uh, respect the requirements for being an Italian food, for instance, or the environment, um, uh, uh, as well as the landscape. Several years ago, um, Emilio Sereni, who was an urban planner, wrote a very nice book on the relationship between uh, uh, the Italian food and the shape of the Italian landscapes. And uh, he proved that uh, uh, the social practices related to food uh, have given a new shapes to the whole Italian landscape. Uh, so uh, the pictures that emerges is uh, very, very complex and uh, includes uh, edible items. And uh, I should say here a, a very trivial thing, not all edible items are food. Uh, for instance, for the Western society, usual uh, pets are not food, but also when one says uh, um, non-human animals are food, uh, the person who claimed that uh, doesn't uh, mean that um, non-human non animal, non animals uh, are uh, not edible, but instead that they are edible uh, and nevertheless they are not food because food entails or includes also other principles. So in order to represent this uh, complex array of uh, factors, relationships, uh, entities, uh, one way is, uh, by, is borrowing an imaging by uh, two nice papers, uh, one by uh, Fleetwood and the other one by Catherine Ritchie, who uh, depicts the social structures as uh, um, lattice work as networks, as in this picture. So each node of the uh, lattice work uh, represents an entity, while each edge of the lattice work represents a relationship between uh, the entities. So, of course, it is just a toy model, it is an overly, an overly simplified picture that doesn't take into account many, many, many other different entities. And, uh, and so it is just to uh, give you an idea of what I mean. Uh, the lattice work uh, works like uh, that each, uh, each node has its own requirements for uh, uh, being occupied by a specific entities and uh, also each uh, uh, edge, so each relation uh, between different nodes uh, provide requirements for the node itself. Such uh, edge may represent uh, uh, produ producing relations, so material re relations or hierarchical relations and uh, so on and so forth. So it is a very complex picture. Uh, and however, a question um, needs an answer. Who can uh, deliver the meaning of each node and the meaning of each uh, uh, edge of this picture? And I think, um, I'm not going to give a proper answer, but I think there are at least two different kinds of answer. On the one hand, one can think that uh, the food system or the food social structures emerges from a social milieu. On the other hand, one may think that there are uh, peoples who can decide how to fill the different nodes and what value uh, give to each uh, uh, edge. And uh, for instance, in many food system, uh, uh, the one of uh, geographical indication or uh, uh, very formalized food industry, there are, uh, uh, of course, people who can, who can decide. But in other cases, more um, uh, in formal cases, uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, meanings uh, of uh, the nodes uh, and edges uh, emerges uh, uh, from the from the milieu. So, uh, however, another um, question uh, uh, needs uh, uh, an answer, namely, um, what about the ordinary meaning of uh, uh, food, namely as an edible item? which role it plays in, uh, in this picture, in this domain. And I think a social ontologist may uh, endorse one of, the, of, of these uh, oh, sorry, three uh, different approaches. Uh, the first is the one I call constitution approach. According to it, uh, food items are among the building blocks of social structures uh, 
uh, as well as roads are among the building blocks of uh, uh, transport infrastructures. But uh, uh, food in this case is a natural object which uh, uh, contributed to uh, construct uh, social reality and, uh, and uh, however it is not a social object it is a natural object which uh, fulfill uh, natural law and uh, which is uh, used for, hum for human purposes but nevertheless it is uh, not uh, a social entity the second approach is quite different and nevertheless it is compatible with the first one and it, and, uh, it says that food is uh, uh, socially constructed concept, while the, uh, its uh, substratum, the uh, material stuff that made up food, is uh, natural. And so natural in the sense it is independent, it is objective, it, uh, it isn't an outcome of uh, social structures. So uh, in order to explain the second approach, I can borrow a very famous image from um, uh, feminist philosophy, uh, that gender is the social meaning of sex, as well as food is the social meaning of edible items. In this case, edible items are largely independent from social structure, while the social meaning of food is uh, instead an outcome of social structure. The last approach is uh, far more radical, and uh, it, states, it uh, states that food is uh, instead a proper outcome of social structures, and so it metaphysically and conceptually uh, depends somehow to uh, our society or uh, to our social world, our social interaction. It is a proper member of uh, uh, the social structures. And so, of course, food is a social object in this case. So we can turn out with a picture like this, with uh, three different ways of understanding the nature of food. Uh, as a natural object, as an epistemic object, object namely as a, a concept, and as a social object. Um, yet, I think uh, the second uh, um, notion of food as a um, concept is compatible with both uh, the idea that food is a natural object in some sense, it is just a misleading way of uh, understanding the term since uh, uh, one can perfectly admit that uh, uh, food as uh, a physical item is natural, while its meaning is uh, instead established by a society, as well as one can say both the object and the concept are socially constructed. So uh, I'm going just to focus to these uh, uh, two different uh, and uh, uh, two different competitors. Um, and uh, as I said, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, provide two arguments for endorsing the thesis according to which food is a social object. And first, I'm going to describe what is the thesis that support the idea instead that food is a natural object, namely naturalism. In order to do that, I give a very general definition and then I try to apply it to a very uh, famous and widespread definition that is the one provided by uh, FAO according to which food is nourishment. According to the general definition, naturalism states that uh, there is an objective, universal, independent standard from uh, uh, human societies or from uh, human uh, social structures that an entity must meet in order to be a food. And actually it seems that the FAO definitions uh, endorse this view since it says that an item in order to be a food should contribute or should have the right amount of energy that should cover the minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle. And this amount of energy uh, should be thought as independent, of course, from uh, human, uh, human social structures. The second thesis, which I label structuralism, instead um, claimed that uh, uh, an entity is, so, uh, is social, is a social ob object, if and only if it cannot be defined without referring to social structures. I uh, could have an endorsed different ways of uh, uh, lay down, of laying down uh, uh, structuralism. For instance, uh, the notion by um, John Searle, according to which a social object is a one uh, 
to which uh, uh, has been assigned a function or a, con a conventional view or a view that says that uh, a social object is the intended or unintended result of a social practice and so on. However, I think that this very minimal definition is not so controversial and then uh, it can be, it can fit uh, the aims of the, the present talk. So now I'm going to present two different uh, arguments uh, for uh, endorsing uh, structuralism. According to the first, uh, that I call the weak argument against uh, and uh, that is the natural uh, doctrine or the natural view, every food definition should refer to social structures and the foul definition uh, refers to social structures. While according to the stronger one that uh, uh, clearly entails the, the, the weak argument, the uh, foul definition, every food definition should refer only to social structures and the foul definition uh, the, uh, refers only to social objects. So let's see the uh, first argument applied to the uh, foul definition. Uh, according to it, food is nourishment, and maybe it is uh, independent from, uh, um, from our ways of uh, understanding uh, uh, reality and also, other, um, and also from other, our social structures. Nevertheless, the notion of minimum needs and the notion of sedentary lifestyles that play a very important role in this definition may be understood as uh, uh, social outcomes of social practices. Indeed, uh, the minimal needs is established by referring to uh, practices such as working or training or uh, living a life so and so or have uh, an active political life or uh, ev everything you, uh, you want, uh, but all of them are social practices. As well as a sedentary lifestyle is a social practice and it is a social practice that is typical of uh, Western societies while there are uh, many, uh, many uh, different societies uh, who uh, doesn't recognize uh, this kind of, of lifestyle, I think about nomadic population, for instance. Um, and so this uh, definition partly refers to uh, social uh, structure and then uh, it provides uh, a definition that of a social object according to the minimal definition of what is a social object. According to the strong argument, even the notion of nourishment and the notion of energy availability are socially constructed, uh, as long as uh, mm, the fact that we recognize that food should be nourishment is a social construction. I come back later to the meaning of social construction, of course, but just uh, take it in the uh, very minimal understanding of it. So uh, nourishment should be, understand, uh, should be understood as a, um, a social construction uh, insofar as many different societies doesn't uh, uh, claim that food should be nourishment, but there are also many other uh, conditions that the food should meet in order to be nourishment. But uh, the, the very trivial examples of dog or uh, of um, cannibalism um, can be used in order to show that nourishment is not uh, uh, an independent standard, as well as uh, the energy availability. Uh, even admitting that uh, there is a way, an independent way of measuring uh, energy availability, and so there is uh, a matrix that is independent from our practices, and I am quite skeptical, as uh, for instance, also Screenis uh, argued uh, in, in his very nice book, Nutritionism. Anyway, even if, uh, even if uh, we can provide these, uh, these metrics, uh, the quantity of energy we need in order to um, uh, be fed, so to speak, uh, is due to a social practices or a set of social practices. So even in this case, uh, the FAO uh, definition may be understood as a definition of food as a social object. Uh, it is just, uh, um, uh, as before, a toy model of the argument because I, I couldn't go through all the definition, all the possible definitions of food. But I think that uh, it is enough to show that it is very difficult, at least, uh, to defining food without uh, 
uh, referring uh, to um, social structures. And uh, mm, I used uh, many times the uh, expression social construction because I think uh, uh, it plays a key role in the relationship between uh, um, social structures and food. And uh, uh, drawing of, on a very widespread literature on social construction, I think at least two senses of it can be applied to uh, food as a social object. Um, the first one is uh, the causal social construction. The uh, second one is the constitutionally social construction. Um, Celia Slanger, in uh, her very nice book, uh, uh, Resisting Reality, um, provide those definitions, but they, they are very widespread in the literature. Also, Asta, for, in, for instance, um, uh, used uh, them, that, uh, those definitions and uh, many other uh, social ontologists. Anyway, according to the first, uh, social factors play a causal role in bringing the food into existence, so, uh, and, and also in the way it is made. According to the second, social factors decide which feature an object should have in order to be recognized as food. So in the first way, social structures, social structures directly cause the, the existence of a food or uh, um, of its features, of its properties, of its constitution, while uh, in the second way, uh, social structures decide which features should be considered as important or as, a, or as essential or whichever metaphysic, metaphysics you buy into about uh, um, identity, uh, you can adopt this, uh, this, uh, this definition to say that uh, the features of the food should uh, correspond to the requirements uh, dictates by uh, social, uh, social structures. So, let me go uh, very briefly here. Um, in the first case, as I said, the existence is caused by social structures. And I'd like just to give you some examples. Um, for instance, uh, selective breeding. In this case, the uh, market needs uh, imposes a new um, way of feeding chicken since uh, the end of the uh, Second World War, and uh, uh, their growth is uh, mm, uh, much faster than in the past uh, because uh, the market needs uh, uh, bigger chicken. Uh, but you can you can think also to the size of Parmigiano Reggiano, uh, which is uh, increasingly grow as uh, Alberto Grandi shows his, in uh, his book Denominazione di origine inventata. Um, the size of Parmigiano Reggiano is uh, uh, grown uh, after the, the, the Second World War because the market needs of uh, uh, cheese uh, were increased in, the, in that period. So in this case, a need, a social need, a need, a need of a market um, play a causal role in the structure and also in the existence of a certain food. Selective breeding, um, uh, provide us a lot of examples. Um, the second way of uh, in, uh, in which uh, social structures uh, uh, construct food is uh, uh, constitutively. It means that uh, uh, certain material features of the food are chosen and that feature should correspond or should fit um, a sort of uh, uh, so to speak, a list of requirements that an entity should match in order to be a food. And I give you uh, just two examples, very, very famous. And I, I, I am, of course, not the first to, to, to give these uh, two examples, Vegemite and Durian. Vegemite is a quite widespread Australian spread uh, that is eaten only by people who uh, tried it for the first time during the childhood, the, the childhood. And so only those people can recognize the features of this spread as corresponding to the one of this uh, very general category uh, of food. 
since uh, any other people cannot recognize them and uh, find Vegemite disgusting. Uh, it uh, shows that the development of food preferences uh, is uh, driven by uh, education, uh, exposure, and various forms of learning. And so the requirements for being a food are dictated by uh, a social structure, as well as for durian, uh, that is a Thailand typical fruit uh, that um, hardly match the um, food preference of people who uh, are not uh, born and grown in, uh, in Thailand, since um, uh, its taste, uh, or, or better, uh, the, 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 yes, its taste uh, uh, cannot be recognized as the one of food. In both cases, what I mean is that the requirements for being a food are decided by social, st uh, social structures. In both ways, of course, uh, in, uh, not, uh, not intentionally, but that uh, uh, is, is not important because, for instance, the fact that a dog doesn't meet the requirements for being a food is, of course, intentional. Okay, so, however, um, this picture is, uh, may seem quite uh, anti-realistic because the food seems to be just a social construction, I still think that we could endorse uh, or we could, uh, we could buy into a um, realist uh, position about food as a social outcome of society. Um, indeed, I think uh, there is at least a, a very minimal sense of realism, uh, which uh, for instance, uh, um, Philip Kitcher called uh, uh, moderate realism, according to which even if uh, a product is made by a social structures, you can uh, um, still adopt to that uh, object a realist, um, a realist stance, because we can conduct scientific inquiry over food food is truth apt, we can uh, speak truthfully about food. Uh, it is a part of causal order, as uh, I, 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 I think I, I show. And uh, last, uh, it has a material realization. Uh, however, uh, it is not uh, still clear, I think, I think that uh, what is the exact relation between uh, social structures and food, namely they construct food, but how do they construct food? Uh, I think there are at least three ways. And uh, here I draw on a, uh, the paper I wrote with uh, Andrea on interpreting something as food, in which we uh, lay down uh, three different kinds of uh, structuralism, which uh, are inspired by um, uh, three different uh, uh, very general metaphysical approaches. The first one is global structuralism, according to which all that exists are human dependent structures. Uh, it is inspired by uh, the realism by Nelson Goodman, but also by uh, the, the deconstructionism and postmodernism, for instance, by Jacques Derrida. And uh, it simply says that uh, there are many social structures and each of which is uh, socially constructed, and each of which uh, um, draw on each other in order to uh, produce new social structures or new components of different social structures. Um, so we can say, paraphrasing uh, the Rida, there is uh, nothing outside the, the cookbook in this case. Um, the second version of structure, structuralism uh, is inspired by the uh, very famous book by Hilary Putnam, The Many Faces of Realism. According to him, while the ontology, namely what there is, is uh, independent from um, uh, social structures, uh, the metaphysics is not. So the way in which the world uh, is, um, is structured, <laughs> is made, is uh, instead dependent dependent on uh, our, uh, our social structures. Um, so what I mean is that we are uh, surrounded by uh, an indifferentiated stuff and uh, our uh, uh, society, social interactions, uh, our text, uh, our theories, uh, our ideas 
set up ways for dividing up in discrete object those uh, these indifferentiated stuff and also give a meaning to these indifferentiated uh, stuff. Uh, it is a, a form of imperialism, of course. The last uh, version of structuralism is negoci the negotiational one. According to it, actually, uh, the reality has uh, a partial structure and uh, uh, society and social structures should negotiate with reality in order to give rise uh, uh, food in this case or object, uh, ordinary object in a, another, uh, in a more general um, understanding of it. Anyway, uh, the central notion of this version of uh, structuralism is that uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the existence of food is due to a mutual negotiation uh, between uh, uh, human beings and their societies and how the world is. Uh, we can decide that uh, a dog is not a food, while we cannot decide that uh, Amanita falloide, uh, the so-called uh, dead cap, is a food since it is poisoning. So there are, uh, uh, borrowing a very famous expression by Umberto Eco, uh, one way of reality. Uh, reality is resistant to some of our practices, but our practices contribute to uh, structuring reality. So it is a form, as I said just before, of moderate realism. Um, in the very last part of the talk, just give me five or six minutes, um, I'm going to test these three different versions of structuralism with an example, a case study, um, which uh, relays, relies on um, uh, this uh, definition of food waste by Thompson. Uh, my aim is uh, to uh, assess whether structuralism can uh, make sense to a viable notion of food waste by give more substance to a very minimal definition such the one by Thompson. Thompson argues that uh, uh, food waste comes into play whenever something is unable to bring forth into the world the maximum of its abilities and potentialities, either because of no use, underuse, or misuse. It is, of course, a model definition of food waste, since it says that uh, uh, an entity that uh, could have been used better was actually used in a bad way uh, or not used in the right way. So it is also a value, a value laden or a normative laden definition of food since it states also uh, what are the, or um, it suggests that uh, a definition of food uh, should uh, um, include should, uh, some, some aims that uh, the entity which uh, uh, meet uh, the definition of food should, uh, should reach, so to speak. So we have uh, this, uh, uh, this picture. Um, a definition of food which includes criteria, aims, and uh, ways of uh, assessing whether uh, the entity um, reached those aims, and a, um, a threefold um, classification of food food that is used in the best way, food that is misused, and food that is underused. Um, for instance, a, a good way of using pasta is making a good carbonara, uh, a bad way is uh, making a bad carbonara, and uh, uh, the very worst way is uh, uh, chewing up the carbonara. So how uh, deal with uh, uh, this um, uh, this classification, how to found this classification, we, which are the, the basis of this classification. Each of the three forms of structuralism uh, gives a different answer. According to the first, the, class the classification, the threefold classification is based on further social structures and all the way down. Uh, and so in this case, the risk is that uh, our uh, classification is arbitrary since there is nothing that says uh, um, nothing, uh, that uh, a, a use of food is uh, 
uh, is misleading or it is wrong because uh, we can only rely on other structures which are uh, as well as uh, uh, the one we are uh, using for, make the for making the classification arbitrary. So in this case, the risk is arbit arbitrariness. And the other risk is absoluteness. Since uh, global structuralism, as uh, it was uh, um, stated uh, in, in, in the extant literature, uh, doesn't have uh, its own resources for uh, um, include uh, different views, different ways of cutting up reality. Local structuralism instead says that uh, uh, what is wasted uh, is, of course, stuff, but whether stuff uh, match or not the uh, requirements for being wasted is a matter of uh, uh, a structure, and so a classification that is uh, largely independent of how the world is. The uh, third version of structuralism instead says that uh, what is wasted should be negotiated on uh, with uh, how the world is. And because it is important, beca because the, um, uh, the notion by Thompson was, um, uh, at, at, at the very end of the day, quite oversimplified. It doesn't take into account, for instance, the fact that uh, uh, the most of food waste is not produced uh, by uh, ordinary consumers, by the, but by the industry. And so the very bad of food waste is pollution, are the byproducts of the production, and so material objects. And in this case, negotiational structuralism can deal with uh, uh, this, uh, uh, so to speak, material excedence of uh, uh, the production process, since it recognizes the role of the independent world in uh, um, establishing our classification, even in the case of uh, food waste. And as well as, and it is very important, um, negotiational structuralism uh, has in its own the possibility of negotiating the different version, the different classifications of what is uh, food waste between different social structures, which are sometimes or often time incompatible. Uh, for instance, what we can consider uh, waste is not for uh, a different society. And it is a very great problem, for instance, for FAO, since uh, their measurement doesn't take into account uh, the notion of food waste of many um, uh, population that are uh, non-Western. And of course, it is not a knockdown argument for negotiational structuralism. And uh, I think that also the other forms of structuralism can uh, include different principles in order to negotiate better the, the classification of food waste. But I think that uh, the strong, uh, the, the, the strengthness of uh, negotiational structuralism is that it includes those principles in uh, its definition. And uh, that's it. Grazie. Thank you, Nico. Wonderful talk. There's lots to talk about, but we'll take a quick break. Maybe we'll take a five minute break and then come back in five minutes. And in the meantime, if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, um, you can 